Welcome everyone. We are so glad you joined us. Um, we are getting ready to kick off our Game Changer Series conversation. And so I know it's lunchtime here in the, on the Pacific Coast, so grab your lunch and uh, sit tight for an engaging conversation. Um, before we get started, I just want to kind of share a few words. Um, you know, what is the Game Changer Series? It's, it's really a series of engaging conversations with change agents on the entrepreneur space that are moving the needle forward for entrepreneurs of color, women, and other marginalized uh, entrepreneurs. And this conversation really will explore innovative models and strategies for collaborative ecosystems that are working. And our hope is that you will leave with an empowered, resilient mindset and gain more tools to be a game changer in your own space. And today we have with us Melissa Bradley, a seasoned finance professional. We will be sharing more about her experience and advocacy shortly. Um, and for now, I will step in and share our screen to talk about a little bit about Working Solutions. Um, I am the Chief Program Officer here at Working Solutions. And um, it's a, it, as a host, I believe it's appropriate for us to give you a little bit of a brief overview of our organization. Uh, before I turn it over to the moderator. So Working Solutions, uh, we are a small business lender here in California, mission-driven dri nonprofits. And we are, as a CDFI, it really means a community development financial institution. Uh, we serve 19 counties and uh, most part of the Northern California from Mendocino to Monterey. And we offer capital and consulting um, and loans up to five years. A little bit about impact, and this impact is growing day by day. We have um, been able to deploy over $50 million of loans and grants and supported over two, almost 3,000 small businesses uh, with an average loan amount of 28,000 plus. And incredibly, we're still maintaining a strong repayment rate. So a little bit about the progress offerings um, to, you know, as a CDFI, we uh, not only offer capital, but also provide consulting. And in the capital space, it's really important to know that, you know, we have cap we have capital for small business loans. We have micro loans, which are up to $50,000. And we also have grants, small business grants, uh, which comes periodically as capital is, uh, is available. And with every loan is paired with consulting support, because we really believe that with, a, with the financial capital, Knowledge capital is just as essential. And so a client that comes in the door gets access to pre-loan support, technical assistance, but they also get access to post-loan business consulting for the life of their, of their loan. And the loan product, a bit for you as an entrepreneur, if you're looking for capital, we offer up to $100,000, $5,000 to $100,000 of, of, of loan uh, capital. And, um, one of the key distinctions I want to kind of name is that we do not have a minimum credit score. And for many businesses, something that distinguishes working solutions is that we support pre-revenue um, stage businesses. So that means that you, for individuals and business owners that are about to launch and they need the capital to open the door, we actually, is the working solutions the right place for you. And again, no collateral needed. And uh, one key also aspect is that if you are taking this capital at the breach financing, there's no prepayment, no prepayment penalty uh, to uh, step into this capital. You know, what are some of the key steps that might be a, a potential client uh, might have to walk through um, when they come in the door? It's first, our process, we pride ourselves in having a strong digitized approach, but then also high touch connection to the um, applicant. Uh, so the first step really is the loan inquiry form, which is all on our website. Anyone can do it. You can do it at 2 a.m. in the morning and get updates and get an immediate um, auto response, either with an application link to move you forward to the full application. Um, and then after that, there will be, of course, a vetting of the documentations that support your, your request. And that really is dependent, that time like will be dependent on the borrower's uh, availability and um, their preparedness. Um, we also, at all times, would always have connections to, to resources, to support network, to help the business owner navigate this um, as easily as possible. Um, and then we move it, once documentations are received, it moves into the time of application decision-making, 
And then the final step is funding and funding happens again, um, all electronically. Um, once funds are ACH to the borrower and payments are start, you know, shortly after again, all you know, on a digital space. So businesses you can be anywhere and be able to get this capital moving, moved forward into your account and be able to use it um, for your business. And so if you are looking for capital or you are thinking about, you know, someone that is in that space that needs it, this is a bit of our information and we encourage you uh, to reach out at any time uh, for support. At this time, I am going to allow me to introduce the moderator uh, for today's engaging conversation, Anita Russell, who is our community development manager. And I would say Anita Russell is a fierce advocate uh, for communities at large um, and uh, a voice uh, that really advocates anywhere she goes to ensure that um, folks are aware of the opportunities and are aware also of connecting the communities to those opportunities. So again, give a warm welcome to Anita Russell. Thank you. Thank you, TT. And welcome to all of you who are joining us today. As our Chief Program Officer, TT has already noted, at the top of our opening, we are glad to have you join part two of our Game Changer series. I am ecstatic to present to you our Working Solutions family and audience, Melissa Bradley. She has accomplished so much. And so what I'm sharing by way of introduction today is only a portion of her impressive bio, but I wanna share a little bit with you. Melissa Bradley serves as the founder and general partner of 1863 Venture Fund. She is also a member of Goldman Sachs, One Million Black Women Advisory Council and former co-chair of the National Advisory Council for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and was named one of the most entrepreneurial women investors in 2018. She is a professor at the McDonald School of Business at Georgetown University, where she teaches impact investing, social entrepreneurship, P2P economies, and innovation. She is the recipient of several awards to include the Ideas Worth Teaching Award, which celebrates exceptional courses that are preparing future business leaders to tackle society's largest challenges and create a more inclusive, just, and sustainable version of capitalism. Melissa is a graduate from Georgetown University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Finance from the School of Business and a Master's degree in Business Administration and Marketing from American University. Melissa, welcome. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, there's a lot to dive into today, and I know you are a, a bold mouthpiece, so here we go. There seems <laughs> to be this prevailing perspective in our nations thinking that we're being hyperbolic about the presence of racism and that things are much better now than they used to be. In one of its online articles, the ACLU cites America, a country established on July 4th, 1776, it prides itself of being a place where all men are created equal, yet inequities fostered from race, wealth and social status have festered in existence to this very day. In one of your many interviews, you noted, at the foundation of capitalism, black and brown people were not included. In fact, they were never meant to be asset holders, but always the asset. Melissa, can you expound? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for joining me and I appreciate folks taking time at their lunch to be here. So when you think about, um, I, I think it was so appropriate that you started with that, <clears throat> the founding of this country. I think one, it's important to note that inherent in the construction of America, everyone was not available to have access to rights, right? The, the Constitution is all men. <clears throat> so I think we have to honor it. I think it's um, fascinating that as we think about the voting patterns of women, that at one point in time they had no rights and so they don't understand that historical construct. Uh, but I think when we talk about that, when that document was written in the founding of this country, only white men had freedoms. Women had no freedoms. They couldn't open a bank account. They couldn't buy a house themselves. And Black people were actually the underlying asset that stood up many of the institutions. If you think about people's farms, uh, if you go back to some of the documents of the lenders who gave them money to start those farms, the underlying asset was not the farm. 
because it wasn't producing. The underlying asset was actually the slaves that the slaveholder pledged against his property. And so I, I think when we talk about this concept of capitalism and wealth creation, there is a sense of irony around the fact that right now, African-Americans remain the most marginalized. And by 2043 for African-Americans and for by 2053 for Latinx Hispanics, we have a 0% wealth, period. That is the decline that is happening. And that is purely systematic from the original power structure that only white men could prevail. And then women thereafter would just be treated as less than. And in that context, people of color and the indigenous community, Native Americans, they would be those that would just underwrite all of the expenditures of who at the time was in power. And I think, unfortunately, that continues. Um, I think that when you look at a lot of the historical institutions that are still standing, including Georgetown University, where I went, we had to acknowledge that that school was built by slaves. Uh, and so this whole pull yourself by your bootstrap. No, the reality is this country is built on the backs of historically marginalized communities who were typically people of color who were taken advantage of because there was there was power that was bought through through violence, uh, through disease, et cetera. And now that power persists through this social construct of racism and in some cases, sexism. Black women entrepreneurs are the fastest growing sector. So I ask you, Melissa, mm -hmm. why are they still, or why are they self-funding and why is access to capital for this demographic largely a barrier? Yeah, so, so let me just put that in a little bit of context. I'll put on my professor hat. So um, there has been a good 20 to 40 year decline in white male entrepreneurship over time, but no one's ever talked about it. And we know all the data that shows that the fastest growing segment of solo entrepreneurs has been Black women, certainly post-COVID. Uh, but the fastest growing small business sector is actually the Latinx Hispanic community. And I think what's important is that those, you know, we know that small business is the backbone of this country. And so how do we systematically decide to not invest in the fastest growing segments out of this notion of fear, power, and racism? And I think what's happened it, why that the growth has facilitated is that one, people are just sick and tired of working for the people. I think two, from a media perspective, we have in some cases, unfortunately, oversimplified this concept of starting a business. And I think three people feel like they can do better all by the damn self. Uh, and so why work in corporate America that does not acknowledge or have a compensation structure that in many cases equally compensate people based on skill and ability and performance versus just race, skin color, gender. Um, so I think we've seen that rise. I think what is, so it's exciting in some ways, except that we know while 50% of all businesses fail within five years, black and brown businesses last at least 8.5 years. So once again, I'm a finance person. Let me preface that. I'm not a poli sci person, not a history, but I'm a finance person. So I deal with numbers. So if you have the fastest growing segment of small businesses being people of color, and we know that that's the driving backbone of the economy, then why are we starving them for capital? And what we found, we found is in that research is that while these businesses led by founders of color are extremely resilient, that 8.5 longevity rate is unfortunately not tied to access to capital. So what's happening is when we say entrepreneurship is the wealth creator, well, we're creating wealth for the people. But in the meantime, we're emptying out our 401ks, we're leveraging our homes. And so in some cases, we're decreasing our personal wealth to build wealth for a larger community and if they do get investment for a bunch of venture capitalists down the road. And so I, I think it's important to note that I don't talk about what I talk about, I do what I do because I'm a black founder or I'm a black venture capitalist. I do it because as an American, I understand that numbers tell the story. American history varies depending on who the narrator is. But the reality is that if you have the fastest growing segment that is contributing jobs and that right now you have a bank like Citibank saying that this country has spent or lost $16 trillion because of racism, I'm unclear how we continue to operate our economic disinterest to preserve an antiquated power structure. And so we work really hard to be able to demonstrate the financial benefits of investing in people of color. That if black businesses had been invested on parity with white businesses, we would have over $100 billion annually in GDP. I'm thinking we need that right now with the recession. We would have had over 900 million jobs in a place like D.C. where I said that would mean there'd be a zero unemployment rate for people of color. And so if that's what we say we're striving for as a country, then it's baffling to me that we are counterintuitive of how we make those investments. And when we say, well, they're not financially stable, blah, blah, blah. 
that's baloney, right? They're not financially stable because the overall structure is tilted towards people who at some point in time are not going to have the capacity to contribute. So what can we do on an individualized case by case, house by house, business by business basis to think about how do we pivot and adjust the underwriting criteria to understand that I shouldn't underwrite a black business the same as I should a white business because they stay in business longer because their source of income is different because research shows it costs a quarter of a million dollars at minimum for a black person to start the same business as their white peer. So I'm not asking people to do anything that's just completely mission aligned. I am a capitalist at heart, but I think we have been unrealistic as a former bank regulator that we don't have the appropriate inputs to run the algorithm that says who is investable and who isn't. Because your great, great, great granddaddy was a slaveholder and has preserved his wealth through that, that is no different than someone who's been able to keep their part, full-time job on the side so they can actually fund their business. But we have this disparity that exists based on perceptions and optics, not the potential of ROI that is now being lost by over-indexing on one population versus another. Can someone say, well, thank you, Melissa. <laughs> Melissa, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to get personal here. So you're okay. very passionate, as we can see, concerning your advocacy for Black and Brown entrepreneurs and raising awareness as it relates to persistent inequities in lending. I can see that this fervency runs deep and stems from your own life journey. And I just want you to take your time right here. Please talk about your experience as a young entrepreneur and what an actual loan officer said to you concerning your three strikes. So I I am, um, I think I'm pretty smart. Um, I know my mom told me that growing up, I think my test scores and my grades say I'm I'm not I'm not dumb. Um, so when I graduated from Georgetown as a finance major, I went to work in corporate America. Uh, I quickly learned that that was not for me. Um, I learned that my division was going to be reorganized. And because we, I individually had booked $19 billion of loans, uh, we were all going to be dispersed across the country to save overhead and travel expenses. And I decided I did not want to move. <clears throat> so I decided to start a business. I told my boss I'm going to start a business here part-time at night, uh, but I'll do all my work during the day. And she said, fine, go for it. And when I finished my business plan, I'm old. It was on a Kinko's spiral bound, clear cover. Um, I took it down to the, the SBA uh, and I dropped it off because that's what we did in those days. And I said, I'll be back in a week. She said, no problem. Let's talk about it. And um, I'd asked for a loan. Um, I'd asked for a loan for $25,000. And when I went back, I was like, all right, I'm ready. I didn't expect to be perfect, but I was like, so give me some criticism. I'll make some changes to the business plan. I had my little word process with me and let's go. And she said to me, she goes, I read your plan and we just can't give you a loan. And I said, well, you haven't even thought about it. She goes, well, I have. And I said, well, you know, I understand finance. So tell me what's wrong. She goes, well, you have three strikes against you. And I was like, all right, I'm ready. It's only three. She said, you're black. I was like, hmm. she goes, you're a woman. I could change that, but I choose not to. And she goes, I don't know any Black women who have been successful in financial services. And uh, luckily, my mom came to my mind. She was like, get out of there before you do something stupid and get your ass arrested. Um, and so I ended up slowly leaving. Uh, I was deeply disappointed. Um, I have since moved on. But I realized there were a couple of things there that had nothing to do with me. Uh, one is that she was living her experience and, and her set of assumptions were now going to block my blessings, which should never be the case. Um, the second thing was, is that she had a different risk tolerance than I did. Um, you know, when we, we had a little bit more conversation, I was like, well, I just don't understand how you're going to pay it back and blah, 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 and how you afford to live. And I was like, that's none of your business. Like, I'm telling you this is going to be successful. But respectfully, I realized that her risk tolerance was very different than mine. And so she, again, was making a decision from her perspective, not mine. There was a lack of empathy. There was a lack of, of any human centered design in that process whatsoever. Um, and the third thing is, is that she allowed the narrative that was prevalent to overshadow what she thought was possible. Uh, which I think is really critical. We don't see a lot of successful entrepreneurs. The fact that we celebrate that, I think there's what now finally a hundred black women have actually gotten venture capital over a million dollars. Like that's just dumb. Like that should like that's embarrassing. But if that's the narrative we have, what happens if that's what people see, that's what they strive for. And so she said, well, there are no black people in financial services. So like, who the hell are you to be the first person? Um, and so I think that that was really challenging. And since then, the SBA has actually issued a formal apology since they've heard that story. But I, but I think the reality is is that it hasn't changed. Um, that when I got to the bottom of the elevator, I literally said to myself, if, if I can do anything in the future, so this doesn't happen to anybody else who looks like me, I will. Uh, fortunately enough, that financial services company that I started, I sold it within 24 months. Uh, of course, that's when the SBA said, you need a loan now? I was like, no. Uh, and started on this path to be an angel investor, uh, to stand up an entrepreneurship program. In this case, it was for young people and their families working uh, using and leveraging the Jack Kemp law that you could actually start a business in public housing as a way to transition people out of welfare and poverty. 
um, went on to do a bunch of other things, served in the uh, Clinton administration, served the Obama administration, ran the Tides Foundation, which is out in San Francisco, worked for Center for American Policy on how to uh, trigger more investment by traditional banks in solar um, and became a professor and on and on. And I, I would say that that experience shaped me that my entire life has been, how do I as a finance person, how do I shift this negative narrative around what can, what and who can drive value and who deserves to have the opportunity for wealth? Uh, and so I do that through teaching. Um, I teach business school courses, entrepreneurship, I investing uh, platforms where I'm the only black professor that does that. There's only two of us in the school. Um, I run this organization and run a family of funds and we invest actively using debt, equity, revenue-based financing, you name it, to support black and brown founders. Um, and we do a lot of research to really help bridge that gap. And so um, that's where I came from. I, I was born, my mom was a single parent. My father died when I was three months old of a massive heart attack. Um, she was determined that I did really well. So she worked uh, as a comptroller during the week uh, and as a domestic on the weekend. And so I saw lots of people who had money, but their kids were dumb as shit. Uh, and I realized that when I got to hang out with the parents, because I was like, I can't hang out with your kids. Like there's, there's nothing there. Um, I realized that most of them were entrepreneurs. And so at a very early age, I knew that I wanted to understand this world of entrepreneurship. I knew I wanted to understand money. Again, I'm a capitalist that this, there, there, there is a mission element, but there is not a social services element because I believe that if we continue to operate from a frame of social service, then what happens is we're sending the signal that we need to be subsidized. I don't need to be subsidized. I need to be given the opportunity. I need to have equal access and equal opportunities to everybody else. And I guarantee you in most cases will outperform. So that was really kind of what has shaped me to where I am now. Yeah, which leads into my next question. Um, please talk about how the industry uses language as a form of oppression and the need for lenders yeah. to reconsider using terms such as minority and marginalization, um, that when these terms are used, oftentimes the applicant is perceived as less than. So let's just talk about the history of credit scores. Uh, I've been very vocal around the need for alternative credit scores. Credit scores were created by uh, shopkeepers, Fair and Isaac, uh, with the designation, or as I said, the goal to keep Black people out of their stores, period. Uh, they felt like Black people coming into their stores uh, during uh, Reconstruction was uh, disturbing to other patrons. And so they said, what's a way to keep them out? And so they created this system that they knew was inherently unequal. Uh, and they use terms like they're marginalized from access to capital and, you know, they're the minority and therefore they can't. And, and that language has both become psychologically damaging that people actually believe it. But it's also right now, today in 2024, highly inaccurate. Um, as I said earlier, I don't do this work just because I'm black and I'm a founder and I'm a woman. I do this work because statistics show what is the fastest growing segment, who are the fastest growing entrepreneurs. And if we believe in a capitalist society that those who want to start businesses should be afforded the opportunity to do so, then why is the money not following? And so I think that, again, having been a bank regulator, uh, I specifically regulated in the West Coast. So I had the privilege to do Hawaii, and that was intentional. Uh, but I also oversaw all the minority development, uh, all the minority depository institutions, of which at the time there were over 90, and now we're dwindling slowly. Um, but I think there's lots of things that banks can do. I, I think that you know the purpose of uh, OCC in this case is now, and I've had the privilege to speak to them, is to really minimize risk. But let's be honest, risk is a highly, object highly subjective thing. Uh, you know, walking into an elevator, depending on your past experience, could be risky. Flying in a plane could be risky. And so what the OCC and regulatory agencies do, they don't tell you what you can and cannot do, but they create a framework. And there's a, an amazing banker who unfortunately uh, lost her bank, but Emma Chappelle was very clear to talk about and define risk. So I think when people say, well, I really want to do this work, but I don't know how, there's lots of ways. You can look at alternative credit score. Uh, you can look at leveraging other diff other types of other sources of capital and different types of capital. So for example, when I ran a foundation, we were very active in providing loan loss reserves to CDFIs that wanted to invest in communities that typically had not received capital. And there was a question of whether or not that they'd be able to pay. Uh, and these were mostly around home ownership loans where it would take time before there'd be home equity for them to actually pay it back. And so we were like, well, let's think about it. How does the public, private, and social sector work together? What, what are ways that I can reach out to a local community foundation and get a loan loss reserve, which we did here in DC to be able to allow me to do a 3X amount of loans so that I actually can solve the problem and any of my traditional investors don't have to worry they're gonna lose their money. But I think we have become complacent with being able to say no in such an expedient way to move on than to think about how can I be innovative and creative within the boundaries of the law and regulation of how do we actually make the system work as opposed to how do we just go along to get along as the status quo and not really think about who's being left behind. 
One of the challenges for black and brown entrepreneurs is, and I really want you to talk about this too, Melissa, um, is the imposter syndrome. You noted in an interview that the lack of belief in oneself is because we still don't see ourselves. What what do you what are you what are you saying there? So you know, I, I think um, I, I know when I started my first company and then I sold it. That was the first time I met a fellow black CEO. And I literally said to them, "Where have you been all my life?" Because I think nothing that we do in this world is easy. Uh, sometimes for some people, getting up is hard. And and what allows us to think it's possible is because we've seen somebody else do it. I think that the the media and the storytellers have been really clear to demonstrate that the narrative having, you know, use an example, having gone to China, uh, I went to China for a month and I kept wondering why I was being, pictures were being taken of me as if I was in the zoo. And finally I had my interpreter explain of how Asian Americans perceive black people based on television. And I was like, wow, well that's kind of scary because they think I'm some shopping and jive in person they didn't see on some, you know, comedy show. And they have not seen the full span of who I am or, or what is possible. And so I think that if we do not do a good job of providing precedent on an individual level or on a collective level, we run the risk of if I am in pursuit of a dream and I have seen no one do it, then I believe it is not possible. Who am I to believe that I can be or, or should be the first? If we also have a set of stories and, and, and heroes and sheroes that have made it there, but they have done so in a way that is suspect or not given credit or not looked upon well, then I'm disincentivized to try that because I, I am mindful of the retribution of, again, how dare I with the assumption that I've done something illicit to get here. And so I do think it's extremely important that we have a, an, an equitable portrayal of what anyone can be and that they are representative in what they see and who they hear so they believe that it is possible. I am a professor at Georgetown, let's be clear, not for the pay. Uh, I'm a professor at Georgetown because I want those MBA and mass, other master students across the other schools know that, A, it is possible for a Black person to teach you something that you don't know. It is possible for a Black person to help you become the global leader that you desire to be in the future. It is possible for a professor to be in a position of authority and make decisions on behalf of your academic career, uh, which is something that I did not see. Uh, and so I think as we oftentimes praise movie stars and music stars, like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad, or you know, we get the Latin Grammys and oh my gosh, we're represented. It's unfortunate that we have to go there, but it demonstrates the significance of people being able to hold on to a fact that their unique life experience is validated. Wow, that's powerful. You know that entre entrepreneurship is one way to build wealth. So I got a two part question for you, Melissa. One, can you for me define wealth? And two, in one of your interviews, you noted wealth happens when there's a belief and valuation. Can you explain that two part question? Sure. So if you think about the definition of wealth um, and you think about the Oxford Dictionary or Merriam-Webster, whatever, usually you'll see something around it's the abundance of, of valuable possessions or money, right? And, and the reason why I'm able to make the analogy that slaves were wealth creators is because we were considered to be possessions. And so I think that if, and possessions are anything that you own. And so it's hard to say that that's equitable because we know, right, studies have shown if a house appraiser walks into a home and there is black art on the wall, it's going to be downgraded at least a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars. So now your negative perception has diminished my wealth. And so I think it's fair to say that wealth can be universally available to everyone, but is not priced equally. Uh, and I think that that's a challenge. Uh, and I think that, which is why we do, I do a lot of research work. I think there's a set of assumptions that just get perpetuated because we think something means something, but language is very important. It's minority versus new majority. Minority assumes I'm not available. I'm not, I'm not eligible. I'm not good enough. New majority scares the shit out of people, but it's numerically true. Wealth is relative. If I have a house that is valued at $2 million, I could have the same house, but if it's on a different block next to, I don't know, some bodega that automatically loses wealth, but it's built the same way, exact same architecture, but different families are living in it. And so I think that there's something fundamentally challenging to our intentions when we say that we are in the pursuit of wealth, because what happens is then we begin to kind of jerry-rig the system and pull different levers to decline wealth on somebody else's part so that somebody else can have more. 
uh, when, when, you know, we go way back, when the settlers came, when the pilgrims came and they ravaged the land, they assumed that there was no value uh, because they it wasn't doing what they were doing. But you can go back to documents and the land that the indigenous community was doing just fine with was worth a lot of money. Um, and so I think that the subjectivity of what is wealth undermined by possessions is challenging in the American context because at one point in time, human beings were possessions and that's just fundamentally uh, wrong. You talked about the term new majority. And so can you explain the term new majority and what will be missed in revenue if we as a nation fail to recognize the new majority is yeah. rising? Yeah. So you know, when I majority, and again, I have had people say, well, like that doesn't seem right. So I'm just looking at it from a purely numerical perspective. When you look at demographic shifts in this country, the fastest growing segments of people are non-white. Let's just be, let's just keep it easy. So we don't get just non-white. When we look at, to your point, the statistics from the Federal Reserve and everybody else has shown, the fastest growing segments of entrepreneurs are non-white. And so when we look at that, it says that from an economic and a capitalist perspective, the segments that are producing or have the potential to produce the greatest wealth in this country and the greatest number of jobs are people of color. How do I succeed and how do you marginalize me when I am the economic driver of this country moving forward? So it's really important to me, again, when it comes to language, that we put it in context, right? That we are mindful that in the world of entrepreneurship and in the demographic space, we are the new majority. We are going to outpace. And it's been talked about, but people keep kicking you down the road because it's scary to the establishment. And I think what's important is that, one, you're missing out on really empowering the people who has no intention of retribution, just wants the opportunity to make a living for themselves and do well like everybody else, and which can only uplift the uplift the larger country. But I think when you talk about what's at stake, what people don't realize is that African-Americans are responsible for 10% of GDP year over year. That's pretty consistent. So you keep kicking us to the side, that's 10% of GDP. We're not exactly sitting in the best spot right now, right? We know that um, because we have not invested appropriately or in, on parity, and we know it costs more to start a business as a person of color, there's probably about over a million businesses that, that have not happened because of this racism, sexism, fundamental challenges and under ready, et cetera. And those million job, those million businesses could have been on average, if you look at the SBA stats, about 9 million jobs and about $300 billion in revenue. And then again, if you just tear that up to the city study, I mean, $16 trillion. And so I just think, again, I, I'm hard pressed to believe, right, that we as a country can afford to just let $16 trillion go away as we think about all the social problems that we have, and we think about all the you know, the the challenges that we're facing against our allies and non-allies. Um, it's just fascinating that the country continues to operate in in not its own best interest in the name of racism and sexism. Well, but I think if we can, I'm sorry, I was going to say, so I, I, my hope, I'm sorry, my hope is that by shifting and using that word new majority, whether people want to agree with me or not, it makes them at least think twice, like what is she talking about and why should I care? Um, that's all. I can't change people's opinions, but at least they go, she's not saying minority. What does that mean? And again, people have acted usually out of fear, but I think if we change our language, then that's important for people to at least think twice before they make some of these decisions they're making. Oh, thank you so much. I, uh, Melissa, I'd, I'd love for you to speak to entrepreneurs who say, you know, I've tried and maybe I failed and is it worth getting back up again? I really believe in this vision I have. I don't know if anybody will give me a chance. What do you say to them, Melissa? I'm a realist. Um, so I regularly tell people um, that this is not a business they should be in. Uh, and I also tell people stick in there, stick with it. Um, I think I think we have painted a very simplistic picture of what does it mean to be an entrepreneur. Um, I think that it requires an ordinary amount of time, uh, significant resilience, clearly a bunch of capital, uh, financial, social, intellectual, uh, and human. Uh, and it requires a level of resilience that at some point in time people just can't take. One of the greatest challenges happening in the foundry community right now is 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 mental stability, not because they're uh, needing of medications or admittance, but because of the stress of just being Black in this country, not to mention being a Black founder. So I say that everybody should have the opportunity to be an entrepreneur and be a founder and just make sure that you're ready for the journey. 
And, and that I do believe it's a team sport. And I know that that's really hard in the black community because when I started my first business, I asked my friends who joined me, they were like, Melissa, girl, somebody need to keep a job. So in case you can't pay your rent, but, but it's a lot to do for one person. And so I would say, just like myself, determine what is your risk tolerance? Um, determine how far are you willing to go? Um, if, you, if you were on the path to actually have assets under management, then make sure that you're focused on assets under management. Uh, no disrespect, but there are some founders, I don't think they're focused on assets under management. I think they're focused on aspirations under management. It's hard work. Uh, and I'm not saying that people don't think it is, but it's more than just a social media campaign. Um, it is about understanding your numbers. Uh, it is about acknowledging what you know and what you don't know. Um, I would I liken it to running a marathon. You really get to know yourself more so than you do the terrain you're running on. But, but I would say that I think the, the possibility is available for everyone. Just make sure that you're ready for that journey. And so can you can you share in this lender space if you were in front of an audience of lenders mm -hmm. what would you say that you haven't said already what additional can you share with us Um I would say two things I would say when I went into the treasury department it was right after the savings and loans debacle which I can say as as someone who had to shut down places and was part of the constitution the resolution trust um, but so far, the economy in America has not failed because Black people did not pay off a loan. Um, yes, and no crisis because wealthy white folks were over leveraged and banks gave them money on second and third homes, fourth boats that they did not need and they could not afford it and it collapsed. So I think it's really important that we look at the historical precedent of where there have been significant market failures and usually people look like me ain't been there. And so when you think about why well, I have to protect my assets and look at what's happened and the banking system is upside down. Even when Obama took over, it wasn't because small black business owners were in trouble. It was because the large investment banks, again, were over levered. So I think one, when you think about what's the worst thing that can happen, know that so far the worst thing that happened had nothing to do with black people, nothing. I think the second thing is, is know that you operate an industry that's highly regulated, but regulators haven't been one. We're mindful that everything is about a spectrum and about a box. And so it's not this narrow aperture. It is what is it you're trying to do and how far do you want to push the box? I mean, people are just kind of stuck on this one spot and they're not willing to push and try. Literally in my meeting last month with all the OCC regulators, we're looking for innovation because we recognize that there is money that A, is not being well spent and well invested where it could be. And I think that that's problematic. And so I would go back and really think about how do you define risk? I review every single underwriting criteria you have and determine what is required to preserve assets versus whatever required to mitigate risk. Preservation of assets is a factual response. Preserving risk is a subjective response and making sure that you are focused on that which is objective and not that which is subjective. And then I would say to really spend some time understanding the community that you serve. I recognize not everybody is in a community where a bunch of black or brown founders are gonna come through the door, but I do think, or come online, but I do think it's important that people do their research. Um, I had the privilege with the research that was supported by the Certain Foundation and Coffin that talked about the cost of, of running, of starting and running a black and brown business, that the ecosystem responded. Lawyers, accountants, service providers, accelerators, uh, angel groups were like, oh, wow, now we get it. Because their thing was, how come we can't find million dollar businesses? I'm like, because we're spending a quarter million dollars to get the damn business started, because we're not getting into programs, because we're turning through consultants, because it's legal for you to charge me more interest. So I'm not, when you see uh, a tech business by, by a white guy from Stanford and a tech business by a black woman from Spelman, the difference is, is not just race and gender, right? The difference is what is their journey and how do we not acknowledge the journey that someone literally had to pay more to get here? Why is that considered a liability as opposed to an asset? And so I just think we have to rethink what is the definition literally of assets and liabilities? What is the balance sheet that we're striving for? Is it one that is risk-free or is it one that actually has the potential to generate outside returns? And I think if you look like investment institutions like Ariel Investments or Ariel Asset Management, investing in people of color has consistently provided an outsized return. Great. I, I am sure all of you listening are just blown away by Melissa. And we certainly don't want to end this without... Um, open it up to the, the audience for any questions. And so right now, I'm just going to thank you, Melissa, so much for everything that you brought. Um, everyone, Melissa was just so willing to be a part of this platform. She didn't give me a whole litany of what to do, not to do, what time to do. Just She just said yes. And so 
We at Working Solutions just applaud you. I applaud you personally. Thank, Thank you. you. So TT, I just want to um, turn this back over to you. Um, thank you, Melissa. Just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. TT. Wow. Thank, you. thank you so much, Anita. Thank you, Melissa. Um, what a riveting conversation. What a really insightful feedback of just the insight that you bring of how you weave in the financial components with the social justice components and the equity. It's completely a new framework. Um, and I really appreciate it. Um, so many gems. Um, and I'm sure we'll be reviewing this and looking at the recording to make sure that we can uh, really you know, absorb every part of this. Um, that you spoke about some key things to so say investing in TOC entrepreneurs, you know, has proven over over time to which have outsized returns. That's something that there's some of the statistics that we need to continuously remind ourselves, you know, that, you know, of, of and then also just reframe it and, you know, challenge some status quo. So I uh, really, really appreciate it. And, and also giving us some insight from the asset manager side of understanding risk. Um, it, it's it, it's incredible. So I'm sure there are questions. So we really want to make sure that uh, those questions we can, uh, if folks can please drop your questions in the uh, Q&A uh, section. They should have a Q&A button available for you to um, drop your questions into. So there's a question here that I'm going to kick us off with and um, as more comes in. So how does one get resources to become mentally ready for starting a business for the first time? What are some recommendations you give uh, for uh, yeah. um, someone to kick it, starting up for the first time? So I think one, um, set up your own risk profile. Um, how much do you have to invest and what do you have to lose? What happens when you start a business is that it's almost like a snowball. It just keeps rolling. And there'll be opportunities that'll come and you'll be struggling to decide. And you really have to figure out how much can you afford to risk of time, of talent, of money, of opportunity cost of spending time with your family. Um, because as I said, it, it's hard work. And so I think the first thing is to talk to other people uh, who have done it and people who've done it and are still doing it and people who've done it and aren't doing it anymore to understand what that breaking point is. Um, I want to reinforce that I think everybody, if they want to do it, should do it. I think that what's mindful, I, I respectfully will say I love to gamble. <clears throat> but Las Vegas is one of my favorite places to visit. And I know that when I go down to play blackjack, which is the only game possible, um, I know exactly what my limit is. I'm going down, this is how much I can afford to lose. And so I think that we have to have an element of rigor uh, and, and create a risk profile that we cannot go beyond or we will be uncomfortable or unsafe or unwell financially or, or psychologically. So I think one is figuring out how much you have to risk on yourself of time and money. I think the second thing is do your research. Um, really understand the industry that you're getting in. And when I say that, I don't mean look at proxies of what other people do. And I'll give a very quick example. Um, I, I spent a lot of time with founders and they're like, hey, I have the opportunity to be on TV and talk about my product. And they get really excited. And I say, what's the ROI on that? Oh my God, Melissa, why are you asking that? I mean, thousands of people online. And I'm like, right. But last time I checked, your website doesn't have any e-commerce. Um, last time I checked, you don't have enough inventory. And so if you do get orders, you're not going to be able to fill them within three to four weeks time. And so now you've ruined your reputation uh, and that you cannot get back. And so I think really understanding the business you're in, what are the cash flow cycles? What are the sales cycles? What are the sales opportunities? And then I think the third thing is get a team. I, I truly believe that entrepreneurship is a team sport. That doesn't mean everybody you pay, but who are advisors? Who are people that you trust who, who are willing to, as we say in my household, your pillow and your mirror? Everybody needs a mirror that looks at you and says, girl, I know you're not going out looking like that. And everybody needs a pillow that says, don't worry, you, everything will be all right tomorrow. But have people around you who are willing to tell the truth. Uh, and I think if you have those three things, you determine your risk tolerance, you have someone who's going to tell you the truth, and you're still going to talk to them when it's over. I think then you have the guardrails to make sure that you stay in line um, and then really figure out what is the opportunity cost that you can afford and have the discipline not to go beyond that. So great. What a great feedback because you really kind of touched on it, the guardrails um, and not just a blind leap into it, um, making sure that you identify at what point you're going to call it quits and you know what's the expense of you know time and money that you're willing That's to right. take on it. That's um, right. And that team is critical, in a, in especially mm -hmm. with Working Solutions as a CDFI. Those are the things, part of the things that we also stress as well that we believe is critical uh, for uh, sustenance of the business. Uh, yep. So 
So incredible. So there's another question here. This is actually coming from one of our CEO and our working solutions. She actually uh, was at the S band. I think I believe you were at the S band. Oh. Um, yes. Conference. Yeah. And um, given kind of just, you know, different platforms that you get to sit on, um, how are you seeing your message um, land either in the classroom or with the other change makers? What What is the response that you're getting in the field? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I would say um, it's landing differently, but not by archetype, by power dynamic. So if I'm in a room of financial institutions and it's a mix of MDIs and non-MDIs, my message resonates with MDIs and it's skeptical to non-MDIs. I think that my, my beliefs, my values are usually are dissected by race, by gender, um, by, uh, upbringing, values, economic status. Um, but I don't hear a different response from a VC versus a bank. I think a lot of it is the orientation. Um, I think where there is a difference is in the student population. I think young people, and I do teach graduate students, are, are just so, well, I mean, I have six kids. They are so well aware of what is wrong in this country. Um, and they are, at least in my class, aware that it is a safe space to have honest conversation of what's going on. Um, prime example, like I'm teaching social entrepreneurship this semester, and we had they had the the group had to pick a collective social problem they were going to solve, and they had you name it. They had food insecurity, uh, access to banking for the underserved, healthcare, women's right, you you name it. And this one white guy who was last in the row said, "These are all great, but why is white supremacy not up there?" And people were like, "Hmm." And I said, well, class? And they were like, well, why did you say that, John? And he was like, well, because let's be honest, all those things you just talked about are all about white supremacy. And I was like, well, who would have thought we'd be talking about white supremacy uh, in an MBA class? And so I think the younger generation are quite astute in terms of how we got here. This was not an overnight phenomenon. So I think that's probably the only class of people, as, as you've outlined, Sarah, so thank you for the question, that is different because they are fully aware. They, they have lived through the ups and downs, the crises, the, the diseases that all were twisted and, and contorted by a power structure that exists. Um, but I think anything beyond that adults, it just falls along either political lines, racial lines, or gender lines. And I should say, it's not because they don't believe it. I think it's because it scares them. I had an executive, and I won't name names and where they work, mm -hmm. who heard me, and he was a white man, and he, he said nothing during the entire presentation. And then later that day, I was still in the building and he said, hey, do you mind if I take you for a drink? And I was like, sure, as long as you're not gonna kidnap me, sure. Cause I couldn't tell where he was. And we must've went like five blocks away. There was literally a bar in the corner. I said, you know, let's just keep walking. I was like, oh shit. Like, let me put on my phone so somebody knows where I am. And he said, I did not feel safe to tell you there, but I totally appreciate what you had to say. And I accept the challenge. And so I think that this concept of peer pressure and what is acceptable conversation and where does dialogue and discourse even still fit in society um, was telling in that man saying, I wish I could have applauded and stood up, but I knew that that would be detrimental to me. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. So a question that's, I mean, that it's, it's such an uh, incredible kind of the dichotomy of just different like responses and how sometimes our lived experiences and mm -hmm. you know, generations could also kind of keep us stuck in certain, in certain places. Um, another question for you, um, with the recent clawback on DEI initiatives and you know, even attack on it, like recent fearless fund uh, getting lawsuits, uh, what what do you think is like an advice that you can give to POC <laughs> organization or organization serving POC to either prepare and like, is it like get ready for the onslaught or is there like just a strategy that you are taking as an organization to fight back or to address this or to stand strong? So just kind of give us some feedback on that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a couple of things, um, and it's painful for me to, to give this answer. So we have three law firms that we pay well to keep me out of trouble, um, because clearly I'm not going to change who I am. Um, we have not changed anything on the charitable side, um, and I don't really intend to. 
I think for us personally, let me say, knowing both the folks at Fearless Fund and Hello Alice, which is actually now a class action suit, um, this is a blatant, well-planned attack. And we, however people want to define we, progressives, Democrats, Black people, women, we're just sitting on the sidelines, not paying attention. What we have seen is that the cases they've gone after is focused on nonprofits. Yes, Fearless Fund has a for-profit entity, but they're focused on a nonprofit, um, which is ironic because it's a public charity. And so basically what they're fighting is say the public should not care about people of color. Like there's some subtext there. So I'll say that I continue to look at what are the organizational structures that I can use to achieve what I want. Um, when I teach social entrepreneurship, I say that just because you want to do well doesn't mean you have to be a nonprofit. Form follows function. And I think what's that saying to me, for those of us in the social sector, is that we better really think about revenue generating activities because the black lash is real. Um, organizations are not being supported. The clawback, if you think about the $600 billion that was committed, less than $100 million was put out there. If you think about the large institutions who seeded a plethora of black fund managers for the first time, who will now not have fund two, and the failure amongst the Black business community that could result because there is no follow-on funding. Um, that's just intentional. And so I think it speaks to the need to be able to control your own destiny. So we look at what are for-profit structures that we can still continue to pursue our mission. All of our funds are for-profit. Nobody so far sued a, not a for-profit. And what are other ways that we continue to think about revenue generating activities so that we, particularly after several uh, lawsuits, particularly Citizens United says that I have to do whatever the hell I want as a company. Um, and so just thinking about what is the form needed so that I could achieve my goals and we're being open and fluid about that. And then obviously still retaining our our three law firms on a regular basis. But it hasn't stopped me from saying what I want to say, probably won't. Um, hasn't stopped us from investing in black people and brown people. It won't. Um, lawsuits don't don't scare me. You know, they're gonna happen. Um, but I think again, people have to determine their risk tolerance. And I am grateful to have a board that supports my risk tolerance, even if it's that not their risk tolerance. Uh, and so I think that's again the first and foremost people that figure out what are they willing to risk. That's so incredible. And um... I love how you kind of stated it is a blatant, intentional, um, well-planned oh, yeah. attack. Uh, but then our response sure. should be also very strategic um, in creating the form and structure that can, um, you know, pretty much circumvent their plans and still be able to do what we want to do and 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 get right. the work done. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you for that feedback. So uh, there's another question here. Uh, you talked about how risk assessment from the lender's perspective is highly subjective and we have to um, redefine assets and, li and liabilities and that was a, a great kind of you know insight so what do you think are some of the underwriting practices and principles that can move us forward towards racial economic justice yeah, so you know, I think um, typically if you look at a balance sheet of a business, we count investments uh, as an asset until they are valued otherwise. Um, if I am an African-American who served this country and came out but was slighted because the GI Bill was not written for me, and therefore I still got a house, you should value the fact that I overcame buying this house and I should be compensated plus what I didn't get from the GI Bill. When we think about the credit score, it's historically based on things that Black people didn't have, like a home. But you know what? I don't know too many Black people missing their car payment. I don't know if people are missing their cell phone bill. So understand what are the assets and liabilities that are important to the constituent you're serving and underwrite based on that person, not based on a swath of people that don't represent that person. Um, you know, the, the things that are baked into the current credit score and having met many occasions on the Fair Isaac, there are things that black and brown people have systemically been left out of because of redlining, uh, because of a you know, mortgage appraising and what's something valued. And so I think you have to figure out how do you reconstruct the parameters and, and the numbers, right? What is your range to fit what is appropriate for that group? And, you know, I think personally putting, putting whether or not we're going to get it in this pol political climate reparations, but those are assets that are owed to us, right? And so I think I'm giving that extreme to help people come back to say, okay, I'm not going to do that, but let me see what I can do somewhere in between. Um, but I just think that things that we have taken for granted 
that have been investments that we are forced to make in ourselves because the system does not account for that. I convinced ecosystem builders and accelerator programs that when they look at a black founder and they're under a million and their target is a million and on plus 250 at least because they've already sunk that in and they invested in themselves. And so I just think we have to think about what are the uh, direct and indirect investments that we are making and how do they get applied? You can even discount them if you want. But understand that no one is showing up to see you without some level of sacrifice, opportunity, cost, or direct investment, and all of that should be put into the calculation. But an easy way to start is just thinking about how you use alternative scoring methods that have been out there for years that just have yet to be implemented uh, across the board. That's so, so incredible. So do you have an alternative scoring that you're using as a follow-up that you've built with maybe proprietary kind of... We we haven't. Um, we haven't. And it's funny because as we think about, we are in the midst of building a tech platform. Um, the second business that I created was a tech platform for small businesses and we sold it. Uh, and so we're thinking about creating another one. Um, and we've been talking to people who are doing these these algorithms. And I think one of the challenges I'm having, and it's one of the funds that we're hoping to start, which is a fund that would support AI for social good, is that you know what's happening now in the financial services that we're taking the human element out and everything is stuck with algorithms. Uh, and I'm not opposed to technology but I'm mindful having sat on um, a committee uh, within a very large tech company that there is just inherent inequity in these AI algorithmic models. And so I'm struggling at this moment to point to something because I think we're moving toward this path of automation when, when we know that up until about nine months ago, um, one of the big company's cars could not see Black people in the dark. Like they could not see me in the dark. And I'm like, well, something wrong with the algorithm. Like, hello, like how are we making killing black people acceptable? And so I think we have to be mindful and, and we would talk with the scientists and developers and I think none of them were people of color. We have to figure out in all of these models, including underwriting, how do we account for unique life experiences? And how do we not devalue those experiences because they are different than mine? How I can't devalue somebody because they went to a they didn't go to an Ivy League school, but they went to school, and for some reason we've allowed the price tag of things to denote value, but that's not what value is. Um, so I think you know there's lots of different ways that we will try to address the inequities that are happening. But I am um, one of my greatest challenges is this because of the fast pace and, and and batching that we have to move to algorithms, and unfortunately I've yet to find a equitable. Uh, algorithm to date, but I'm hoping somebody's going to make one. Yeah, well, incredible. It's it's one of the things we're as working solutions also grappling with and have made some steps. You know, for example, in um, define redefining what you know equity investment you know it looks mm -hmm. like. Um, and so we had to kind of look at sweat equity and try to quantify that in a way that that also supplements what they are bringing to the table financially. Just like you said, the time that it's spent, you know, in, in building things, you know, that has never been maybe identified or or even acknowledged. And so I think building right. a way to acknowledge those things and, and, and even for entrepreneurs to start advocating and having a narrative, a way of uh, of being able to be explicit about it so that it becomes yep. a norm rather than an exception. Um, so that's this right. is really incredible. I uh, think framing, we could go on and on with this conversation. I think there might be one more question and I would wrap it up. Um, it looks like, okay, no, it's not a question. So I think this is, uh, oh, there's a wonder what about Melissa's thoughts on the compounded discrimination on race and age. I think that was the last, that'll be our last question. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there is, um, there is, there is definitely compounded discrimination. I mean, I, I see the question, so I'm black, uh, mm -hmm. I'm over 55, and I'm gay. Well, I mean, I, there's my three strikes right there, living in America, right? Um, and so I, I think that um, it's real. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I, I'd like to believe uh, and I say this as a person who is old, -er, um, if I had to rank it, and it's horrible they even have to go here, I still think race and gender outweigh age when I think about the different cases that have come up in terms of where discrimination is. Um, I also think depending on where you are, there are some places that um, are mindful that age, and particularly those above 30 uh, actually have value 
right? There, there are there are countries and cultures where eight year olds have more value than a twenty year old. We happen to come from an agricultural society where if you could lift the hay and do the work, then you are more valuable. And so I I feel like we can we we will and have to shift this concept of age, particularly if economically we continue. We are not that far away from those small towns in Italy that had to bring all the retired people back because nobody was there to run the factories. So I, I think that there will be an economic uh, awakening around age and these forced retirements and what can happen because we have not done a good job of creating a consistent workforce that can actually do the work as opposed to just sit around and think about it. Um, so I do think that there is there are proxies in other countries where age has been reduced to not be a factor, but more around experience and wisdom and maturity and, and, and life outcomes, as opposed to, well, you know, you're 55 and, and discard you. I think that there's administrations in Japan that are specifically designed to make sure that the older community is engaged from their perspective because of history and culture. I think indigenous communities have consistently praised and honored older people because they're carrying down the traditions. I just think it's it's a, a unique factor that is shifting in America as the country gets older. Um, and I would make a joke, but I, I know y'all are CDFI, but we could potentially have the oldest president ever. So I think whether that's good or bad, but that we are consistently seeing examples where age is becoming less of a factor. And I think as this continues, age will not be the pervasive outlier in terms of how someone experiences um, any kind of discrimination. Wow, quite quite impressive uh, feedback. Just based on your academic research, I think the insight and your finance, like season finance, like you know, um, context as well. You really just kind of blend everything well and your lived experience. Um, and really appreciate also your radical candor about just just some reality check for entrepreneurs as well. Um, and so we, like I said, this is this is our last um, question, but I'm sure we'll have you back again at some point. I'm going to turn it back to Anita. Thank you again, Melissa. Uh, Thank you. This. Yeah, appreciate it. Well, I just want to say to Working Solutions, to Sarah, and to our viewing audience, thank you so much for being part of this platform today. Melissa, I can't thank you enough. We have walked away with a lot. So with that, I want to bid everybody adieu. We'll be coming back to you real soon with a continuation of our series. Have a great night, and thank you again for joining us.